So the motion before this house is this house would allow ex-convicts to apply to join the workforce. And with that, I invite the first speaker of the proposition to open the case for the government side. Here, here. Hi, uh, just another reminder, I'd prefer POIs in the chat, please. Thank you. For too long, have vulnerable communities been terrorized by the police? The murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others have shown the depth of this issue. There is a fundamental disconnect between the communities that the officers have sworn to protect and the officers themselves. It is time to bridge that gap and get a constructive police force that can actually solve crime rather than perpetuate it. Before I move into some points of framing, what is our model? Note that this motion is simply about allowing ex convicts to apply. What this means is that they will still go through an application process. This looks like, for instance, having to meet general requirements, whether that be physical, whether that be about your education background or a psychological evaluation or just extra background checks in general. This also means you're likely to go through an interview to see your character. So if you're someone who was convicted of racist hate crimes and your general attitude hasn't changed, we think you probably still wouldn't be desirable for the police force. Secondly, who do we think is going to apply under this motion. We tell you for the most heinous crimes, think of, for instance, mass murder, your sentence is likely to be too long to the point in which by the time you've served your sentence, you're probably too old to apply to be part of the police force. Thus, we think it is generally ex-convicts who probably committed less serious crimes. This looks like, for instance, petty theft or drug-related crimes in which they still have a lot of time um, after they've gone out of jail. Third, the third point of framing, why do we think convicts will apply? We tell you this is for two reasons. Firstly, in the status quo, as an ex-convict, you already have limited options once you've served time, largely due to social stigma. But secondly, we tell you as an ex-convict, you have incentives to probably want to help individuals within your community. For instance, it could be kids from your neighborhood or others who went to high school with you. So we think that there's general incentives for ex-convicts to want to apply. Before I move into our argumentation, I want to push two, si two points of framing. Firstly, a side proposition, we believe in the principles of rehabilitation, that once individuals have paid their debts to society, whether that is through serving time in prison or facing other consequences, we don't think you should be further punished. The status quo is one in which ex-convicts are still punished even after they serve their time. We think that is simply unjust. But secondly, we think another problem with the status quo is that there's just a large disconnect between the police force and the most disenfranchised communities. This tends to look like the most vulnerable communities to commit crimes. This looks like, for instance, more impoverished neighborhoods. And what we see happening is police who tend to implement aggressive and demeaning tactics. This looks like racial profiling, the whole concept of stop and frisk, where you search people you deem as suspicious, usually those individuals of color, and honest, uh, and in general, just being demeaning and aggressive in your behaviors, talking to individuals within these communities in a condescending manner. We tell you that is the problem we as proposition aim to address. Before I move on, I'll take a point. On your side of the house, ex-convicts are not only just people that have committed a crime, but have gone to prison for that crime. These are not petty crimes. They have to be decently violent in most states. Look. I don't think this is true. In the status quo, oftentimes you likely over punish someone. You see oftentimes people who have who have committed drug related crimes who end up going to prison for way too long. We think that's just, uh, we think your framing is not related to the reality. Okay, in our speech then, why do we think ex-convicts have valuable contributions to the police force? Firstly, what are the unique experiences of ex-convicts? We tell you there are three things here. Firstly, they're more knowledgeable about the reasons why people commit crimes. They have been put in a position where they had to commit crimes. For example, as an individual who grew up uh, grew up impoverished, who are then forced to, for instance, deal drugs within your neighborhood, you're more likely to understand the psychological reasoning behind, behind why one individual do that. Secondly, we tell you oftentimes ex-convicts already come from high crime areas where communities are systematically disenfranchised and disproportionately targeted by police. What this means is they're likely familiar with people already within the neighborhood. They understand the relationships within these communities. Thirdly, we tell you convicts understand what is what it's like to be on the other side of the law. They've been in a position where they've been labeled as outcasts of society. They've been deemed evil by the public. They've been told they don't deserve second chances where any last shred of dignity 
has been destroyed. We tell you these people fundamentally understand the mindsets of criminals then. Why do we think then these skills are lacking in the average police officer? We tell you there are three reasons to this. Firstly, the average police officer have these work incentives to get as many convictions as possible, for instance, for promotion, because, um, because they want to get to a higher level. Secondly, we tell you oftentimes there exists a toxic police culture. This is the idea of being as tough on crime as possible. Look at, for instance, in the United States, where you have very, uh, incarceration rates that continue to grow like almost exponentially. Thirdly, we tell you due to the current disconnect, uh, as we've established in a problem push, you're just unlikely to be able to relate to committing a crime or what it's like to be a criminal to be put in that position. What this means is that for the average police officer, there is a massive disconnect, but also large incentives for you to treat other in, uh, to treat the average person in a terrible manner. Why do we think then that ex-convicts have very valuable skills? We tell you this is for three reasons. Firstly, they're likely to be more empathetic. Note that even if there is a toxic police culture, the, the fact that you have different experiences from these other police means that you're less likely to buy into that toxic police culture. This means you're less likely to charge someone with a small crime. This means that you're more likely to be able to approach people with an understanding instead of directly blaming them. Note that this is what allows for more constructive solutions. This is what changes in the tone on how you talk to individuals or even how you treat individuals and and such. Secondly, we tell you you're more likely to have insider information. Note that this helps both in the way in which you interact with the community because, for instance, you may have less of a culture shock or you understand how individuals uh, cooperate or work, but also in finding criminals. But thirdly, note that even if we do not have a ton of ex-convicts in the police force, you can change other police officers' mindsets as well. This is in two ways. Firstly, note that if your colleague that you see every day, the person that you share morning, morning coffees with every day is an ex-convict, but this person has shown you nothing but compassion. You as a police officer is more likely to change that man's mindset. But secondly, we tell you that as ex-convicts, you're probably going to reach a certain point where you also share your story with other police officers or with your colleagues. What this then means is that you're also likely to open their minds up to different um, understandings of why people commit crimes. What? Why do we think then this is also able to change the perception of the general public? We tell you the general public already has existing trust of the police that tends to be quite strong and difficult to change. But even if you have some distrust, being able to see that the police continues to function properly even after this motion is passed will probably wash away your doubt. But more importantly, why is this better for communities vulnerable to committing crimes? We tell you this is for two reasons. Firstly, there's more trust. As we've already said, the police force is likely to send certain police officers to areas they are familiar with, given that they have a better understanding. For such communities, you're more likely to trust someone that went through the same experience as you. This is important because oftentimes, these are the very communities that are most reluctant to report crimes in their area because they fear the police. In our world, when you are in trouble, regardless of where, which neighborhood you come from, you're less likely to be scared to call the police. You're likely to be more cooperative and more comfortable talking to police during an interrogation. Secondly, we tell you for these communities, they'll likely experience less police violence. This is for two reasons. A, because these police officers are just less likely to react violently since they understand about criminals and what it's like to be on the other side. But B, they're also less likely to be scared, which means they're less likely to react irrationally or react in the spur of the moment. Why do we think that these communities are the most important groups? Even at, at at best for proposition, in the short term, people may be apprehensive about ex-convict police officers. Even then, we think it is most important for vulnerable communities to improve their relationships with the police. This is because they are the ones who are most likely to interact with the police. These are the ones who need the protection of the police the most. I am so proud to propose. I uh, thank the first speaker of the proposition and invite the first opposition speaker to present the opposition case. Here, here. All right, um, am I perfectly audible? Awesome. 
Psi proposition gives you all these grandiose claims about solving police brutality and the structural problems that affect police departments. But it was very unclear to me why hiring a couple more ex-conflicts was going to solve the structural issues that exist in police departments, the massive levels of corruption, the endemic levels of racism that were constantly going to be applied to minorities. They never gave us any structural analysis why these ex-conflicts were going to be able to internally reform police departments. So if anything, on their side of the house, it was going to be business as usual. We're going to prove to you why the harms they get are going to completely outweigh any of the marginal benefits they get about increasing things like empathy. I want to begin with some levels of framing. First of all, I want to note that this policy is principally legitimate, that in plenty of other jobs, people use things like background checks and psychiatrics checks to like to, to, to uh, like filter out who actually gets a job. And I think the same thing applies here because ex-convicts have a high propensity to break things like laws, which is why police officers don't actually hire them to the force. The same thing applies for things like education, because it's very possible that someone that committed a sex crime could have reformed themselves. But these are the kind of people that you don't want to uh, want around children, which is why you don't hire these people to the education force. Second of all, we don't think that the only job that convicts could get is entering the police force. We like supported other means of helping out these ex-convicts, whether that be rehabilitation and job training. Additionally, we think there's a movement across the world in the status quo for, to push for reforms on law enforcement to solve back for police brutality and ensure things like accountability. Finally, I want to note that they try to like make it seem like, oh, these are just some people that commit petty thefts. This is not true. Ex-convicts are people that directly go to jail. So we think this actually does include things like serious crimes. It's not just crimes of possession, things like assaults and drug dealing. It has to be people that go to prison. The final piece thing, like the final thing I want to uh, respond to here is they're like, there's going to be things like character checks. I would argue it's very difficult to evaluate things like character and things like implicit biases. These things already fail in the status quo. Let's Let's respond to their specific claims. The first claim that they gave you is that these police officers would be very like empathetic and less brutal to uh, individuals in minority communities. Number one, I would argue that these ex-convicts are likely to get corrupted by justice systems, that they were likely to be pushed on by their uh, like the people that yeah. are at the they were likely to get radicalized, no thank you, which would inherently change them to continue uh, like uh, pushing for these brutal policies. If anything, we would argue that they are likely to overcorrect and act even more abusive in order to like uh, get legitimacy within the police department and not be viewed uh, as, a, a, as someone that like uh, is negative against the police department. Second of all, I would argue that these kind of structural reforms, i.e. how you treat different people, how you do investigations, is not decide, decided by the average police officer. It's instead decided by like the police lieutenant and and the sheriffs. It was very unlikely that ex-convicts were going to be able to get all the way to the top levels of police uh, police departments. This was something that was very undesirable. Finally, I think there's other ways of interacting with your community. Plenty of uh, uh, like police departments realize that there's a disconnect with their community, so they do things like community outreach policies, youth development, different things like that. That's all possible on our side of the house. The next thing that they tell you is that this will change the minds of police officers. I don't think this is true. Police officers are basically indoctrinated to view conduct as criminals, as people that are negative yeah. and to society, no thank you. Just because they have one new coworker does not mean that they're like that they magically become uh, less violent against people uh, that are criminals. Finally, I would argue that they make an argument about minority trust. But I think minorities, even if they see that like a criminal and a drug dealer is now in the police force, that doesn't mean they're more likely to trust police officers. They still view police officers as negatively as police officers have a history of disproportionately incarcerating them. It was very unlikely they would solve for this. Let's move on to our substantive material. Our first substantive argument is why ex-convicts are simply worst police officers. What are the powers of police officers? Number one, they have enfor enforcement powers. They control how laws are being applied and who gets punished. Secondly, they have legal protection, things like qualified immunity, given they have the purview and they're being glorified. Third of all, they have direct powers. They have access to things like weaponry, which they can use in self-defense. Why was it harmful then for ex-convicts to be police officers? Three reasons. Number one is corruption. Even after jail, convicts still have criminal connections. They likely grew up in an environment of crime. And when they went to jail, they had to join gangs in order to ensure protections. This probably causes them to have yeah. obligations and debts they have to pay back, no thank you, to criminal groups. This was problematic, A, because it would lead to uh, complacency. These convicts were likely to fear retribution and let crime pass. This was very problematic in places like Mexico and Brazil, where there were cartels present and people would fear retribution and attacks if they were aligned with their cartel. Secondly, it causes them to cut corners. These are individuals that have already broken the law, which means they're less likely to have trust for the law and respect for it. That means that when they're solving crimes, they're much more likely to cut corners and do things like prematurely 
detain people or falsify evidence. And due to state failure and reasons why prisons cause mental health conditions and they don't provide proper rehabilitation, they're more likely to be desensitized to things like violence and more likely to resort to violence when they're enforcing crime. The final thing is that the kind of uh, ex-convicts that get hired have perverse incentives. Because at the end of the day, the majority of convicts disrupt, distrust the police. They probably don't like the police at all. So who are the people that are likely going to apply to the police departments? It's the people who want power and control, who want to use the police force to punish their adversaries, i.e. this looks like white supremacists that are joining the police force to go against minorities. So on their side of the house, you saw a massive increase in, in crime and a lower quality of criminal enforcement. Before I move on to the second substantive, I can take a point if there is one. Your very analysis of how ex-convicts will still be committing crimes only emphasizes our points of stigmatization against ex-convicts. How do you solve this problem? I, I don't really see how it changes anything about stigmatization, right? Like people in either world are still going to be viewing uh, 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 criminals and, and ex-convicts as being stigmatized. I'll explain more of this in my second substantive. Our second substantive is about the public reaction. This takes them at their best ground and, are, and argues that like what's most important is the perception of the criminal justice system. There are three reasons why people are going to have negative views of ex-convicts being hired to police forces. Number one, there's a stigma of ex-conflicts. Con convicts are viewed as people who are menaces to society and an evil. So in television, convicts are dramatized as being harmful to society and doing very negative things. Additionally, many people have personal experiences with criminals, with this, which is like very tra traumatic. So for example, they may have a personal possession that was stolen, or they may experience some trauma due to crime. Second of all, the types of people that are getting hired are likely well known in the local community. Because as they tell you themselves, it's the same convicts that committed crimes in the community that are now coming back and serving on the force. This is going to cause people to become very angry when someone that was a notorious gang member or criminal that is now getting on a police force. Third of all, it would lead to media, uh, uh, it would lead to um, the media to, to cause like more extremism and essentially blow this up. Because what the media would say is the same people who are robbing you, the same people that are getting co committing crimes are now getting the guns and enforcing the law. So even if there were some success stories, the media will dramatize this drug dealer that committed negative things finally being able to get on the force. This was very likely in places like New York and, and, and major cities where crime is rising, which means that hiring people like ex-convicts was incredibly controversial and likely to cause massive levels of public backlash. This had two impacts. Number one, it was bad for ex-convicts themselves. Massive levels of public backlash against this effort will cause people to like criminals a lot less and be less sympathetic. So number one, you see more draconian measures like mandatory minimums. What people actually do is that they keep ex-convicts in jail longer to prevent them from actually getting into the police force. Second of all, it causes less societal support for things like rehab and rehire because of the public uh, retaliation against this measure. Second of all, this is bad for criminal enforcement. If people see that criminals are getting in the police force, they lose trust in the police and the police lose legitimacy. You need trust in the criminal justice system for it to work. You need people to report crimes in order for them to get solved. You need eyewitnesses as trials in order to verify that crimes actually happen. Even if you bought at the highest ground on their side of the house and you got good officers, if the public perception went down, then the criminal justice system could never perform properly. Thank you. I'm claiming the first speaker of the opposition and invite the second proposition speaker to continue the case for the proposition side. Here, here. Hi, hi. Uh, I'm just going to presume I'm still audible. Uh, I'd like PYs in the chat, please, as a reminder, and then I'll start my speech. <clears throat> Opposition wants us to solve every single problem which has ever existed in the police force. Sure, I guess, we concede, we won't solve everything. However, in certain specific instances, since yes, we agree, there will be very few instances in which convicts are likely to be hired by police officers, those convicts are likely to be the ones that are going to make the, diff uh, the difference. A couple of things then. First thing, in terms of rebuttal. Three things. One, now in terms of the point about it being illegitimate, I think this was rebuttal, but I'm worried that they're going to frame it as an unsubstantive later. So basically, they're say it's uh, uh, illegitimate to hire these people as police officers since they're likely to break laws. Uh, the, the problem here is uh, you apply the same standard to everyone. So for instance, if this specific ex-convict is more likely than any other police officer to uh, to, uh, to commit a crime, to engage in corru uh, corruption, they already have existing te uh, tests which try to, uh, try, to, uh, try to capture those kinds of things. 
kinds of things. So it's not like we're going to let any random eggs convict in. So we're already in first. No, I do know there's a response there, but I'm going to get to that in a bit. But first, I want to because first I want to respond to their two substantive arguments. The first is about worst police officers. Before I do go on, I'll take a POI. On your side of the house, the checks of oh going through an interview process are most likely to weed out people who are like like perceived more likely to be less friendly. For example, minorities in the first place. Your world is predisposed to put people in power with guns. Um, okay, so that's completely symmetrical. I'm not quite sure how you're going to solve for that on your side of the house, but also weeds out your biggest impacts when you talk about like literal white supremacists who are go going to now come into the police officer, uh, uh, police office. Firstly, in terms of worst police officers, they have three reasons for this. The first is about corruption. Three things here. One, I think this is going to happen on either side of the house. The reason why there's going to be corruption isn't because one police officer randomly decides that they're going to leak information or going to uh, going to change plans or whatever. It's because like, for instance, the cartel or some kind of gang is going to come up to you and uh, uh, and give you a, a, bri a bribe to uh, act in some kind of corrupt uh, corrupt way or because in your own personal incentive to do so. So I think those kinds of bri uh, bribes and those kinds of personal incentives exist on either side of the house. But secondly, we think it's specifically less likely that these police officers are going to be offered bribes and things like that. Why? Because when, for instance, it becomes apparent that there's a mole in a police department, it's always going to be the ex-convicts which are going to be invested for, uh, investigated first. If I'm a cartel or a, ga uh, or a gang or part of the mafia or whatever, those are the kinds of people that you don't want, uh, don't want to give bribes to. Thirdly and lastly, I think these officers specifically, because of their own mechanism about having to overcompensate, are likely to be the ones to call out corruption when they see it. Because those are the police officers which need to prove that they are the ones which are going to be played by the uh, played by the rules, since the existing prejudice will be that they are unlikely to follow the law. So those are uniquely the kinds of police officers who are most likely to call out corruption and to call out bad behavior when it happens. Secondly, they say that they are more likely to be violent because you're desensitized to violence while you're in prison. Sure, that's true to an extent, but also, uh, but it's all, uh, but it's not completely true. The reason that you are desensitized to violence is because it happens so many times to you. So sure, by now, if someone inflicts pain upon you, that will hurt relatively less than before you went through the experience of jail. But still, it hurts now. But more importantly, you remember that that experience was uh, was torture. So we think people are uniquely less likely to want to be violent, explicitly because they've been the one on the side of the beatings. The vast majority of other police officers come from more privileged backgrounds. They come from more conservative uh, communities where they've never had that kind of expo uh, exposure to the violence they're commit, uh, committing to people. Thirdly, they say that people who want to punish uh, uh, others will be the ones to apply, like, for instance, white supremacists, uh, white supremacists. Firstly, I think it's unlikely that they're going to get through the checks and balances that we give. Secondly, even if they pass those tests, we think still police officers are unlikely to want to explicitly hire white supremacists. Why? Because, firstly, that's incredibly bad press for your police uh, police office to the extent that you're not only just hiring an ex-convict, but specifically someone who's also a white supremacist, which is kind of a hot issue, uh, hot issue right now. Now. Secondly, because apart from the fact that you're just hiring that person, that radically increases the uh, the chance that you get, for instance, a number of instances like George Floyd, which led to the police office almost getting uh, almost getting defunded across the United States. I think there are unique incentives as to why individuals who are uniquely likely likely to want to cause harm upon others, like white supremacists, are unlikely to be the ones who are allowed in, even if you ignore our mechanism of how current uh, current systems are likely to correct for it already. Secondly, they say people will uh, will uh, will hate them and be very distrustful of the peace. Uh, by the way, no thank you. To those POIs. Uh, the, firstly, they say two things. They say people dislike cr criminals broadly, and the media will likely want to blow it up. Two things here. One, we think it's unlikely given that they say that our impact is incredibly marginal. If there are like three ex convicts in like a state or whatever, we uh, who become part of the, uh, uh, the police office, then it's unlikely that it seems like media is going to want to blow that up, specifically because it's very hard, no thank you, to, to find those kinds of incidents and in which you can blow it up to a significant issue. So BLM starts getting tra traction, in which there are wide scale public incidents of, poli uh, of poli uh, police abusing black people in America. We tell you at the moment in which the scale is radically reduced, which they do themselves, then you get less of these instances. That means that it's less profitable, uh, profitable and likely that the media, uh, media is going to want to blow these things up. Secondly, we think at, work, at best this is incredibly short termist. So sure, in the short run, individuals are going to be confronted by the fact that they're ex-convicts in the police. But over the long term, it becomes something which is normalized, something which you don't don't actively think about because it's hard to think about these things in every single life and people will grow up uh, and new generations will grow up with this being the norm already uh, already and secondly because the media doesn't cover the same story uh, stories for months upon months upon some months especially when it has such an incredibly small impact as these things lastly in terms of they say firstly this means that when people dislike uh, dislike ex-convicts that means that they're less have less sympathy to convicts in general this is strange because this is kind of circular reasoning they say people dislike convicts 
Therefore, they dislike convicts and the police. Therefore, they dislike convicts in, gen uh, in, ge uh, in general. People who already dis dislike convicts don't see this del uh, delta then. But secondly, they say they're le more likely to want to retali retaliate against convicts and like, I guess, make prisons even worse. Firstly, I'm unsure exactly why that's going to be the case. Secondly, I'm unsure why this would be such a big issue that people are going to be changing their votes and deciding their votes and, decide, and polls are going to be asking these kinds of questions. So overall, I thought this was spe specifically in terms of operating on a national political level, this was kind of a reach for side opposition. What's our case then? Firstly, I want to start with our version of this argument, which is significantly better because we don't try to make our impacts too big. Our case is simply that in smaller local communities, we're more likely to get ex-convicts who are able to bridge the gap between communities and the police officers. What do they say? Uh, what do they say? They say that uh, uh, all the other problems as to why com communities distrust their police still exist. Firstly, we explain in our uh, uh, we explain why this has a crossover effect where other police officers are likely to engage in better behavior as well. But secondly, also note that that may be true. You may just trust all police officers except the one that you know well enough and uh, uh, well enough and are able to connect you on a personal level. But that still means that you're more confident in calling the uh, police and calling that police officer specifically when you need them. Secondly, note that they never engage with the mechanism about less police violence. They just say, oh, that's a structural problem that you can't fix. The problem here is that hiring police officers is is zero sum. So police, uh, police, uh, 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 police officers, uh, police precincts have specific budgets which are set up by the government that they can spend on employing police officers. That means if they choose to hire one person, that means that they're not going to use that spot for anyone else. So when we prove that ex-convicts are uniquely less likely to engage a, 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 in structural violence, that means that overall we lose a person who would be significantly more likely. So in likelihood, we get less uh, uh, police violence in, uh, in local communities. Therefore, we get less distrust, uh, distrust. Then in terms of that certain ex convicts make excellent police officers. All they say is that character uh, character checks are fail in the status quo. One, we would contend this and say that in the status quo, they're quite good, specifically because there has been a massive amount of states to control the amount of people and uh, to control the kinds of people which get into police officer, uh, offices. But secondly, especially for ex-convicts, there's some extra incentives for, for uh, a police precincts to be extra, extra careful. They then say that you're going to overcompensate by being very abusive. This doesn't engage with an analysis. As an ex-convict, you know what it's like to be put for the system. You know what it's like to get beatings in jail and, uh, and by the police on the street. That's why you're less likely to engage in these kinds of things when you're a police officer. That's why these are better police officers and you feel prop. I thank the second speaker of the proposition and invite the second opposition speaker to continue the opposition case. Here, here. Great. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Um, um, and I, again, I would prefer uh, verbal POS. The biggest problem with proposition is their own disconnect from reality of police departments. In the status quo, we are seeing a large movement across the world to make police departments less discriminatory and less brutal, especially towards marginalized communities. The problem with their case is that they implicitly assume that all of this change, all of the justice that is being done to bring the police that have brutalized and terrorized minority communities to light, all of the actual structural changes in getting rid of protections from police that kill innocent people is coming from within police departments. This is fundamentally wrong. All of the changes that they tell you about within police departments to make them better 
come from the outside. They come from community organizing groups. They come from social justice groups. The reason why they will never come from the inside and they haven't come from the inside, and I'll note, I'll challenge the proposition to give us one example of a police department from their own, despite the unions, despite the pushback and despite the hero worship to create their own structural change, is that anything that they tell you about is immediately never going to happen because of the high likelihood that anybody that joins the police force is going to fall into the same corrupt practices. If they wanted to access any of their impacts, they should be encouraging ex-convicts who know the system, who know what it's like to be convicted and to be the, who, to experience the dark side of the justice system to join these groups and to make change from the outside, they're never going to do so from the inside. Crowds will post. Two things in my speech, then the third substantive. First, on how they make police less effective and just, and second, on how this worsens the view that communities and societies have of both police and ex-convicts and why that is so bad. Given for that, for given that both on how this makes police less effective and just within their communities. We get three statements from the proposition. They tell you one, that these convicts are going to be able to change the mindset of police, two, that they're going to be able to bridge the disconnect between the police and the community, and three, that they're going to be able to like mobilize insider information as an ex-con in order to like solve a bunch of crimes and help the police be a lot more effective. We have a few responses. First, I'm gonna take them at their highest ground. Let's assume that the only reason that people are joining after they've been convicted is because they are just like genuinely good people that want to like help society. We have two responses. Number one, we think it is very likely that they are going to be corrupted by the systemic failure that they spent like eight minutes in the Prop 1 telling you about that already oh, exists wow. within these police forces. They haven't told us how a low ranking member of a police force is suddenly going to make all of these like grandiose changes that people have been like trying and failing to make for like the last 20, 30 years. We think that it's very likely that in order to get onto the police force, ex-convicts are really, really, really going to have to pander to the people that are hiring them. Police forces are predisposed to hate convicts because their entire job is getting rid of crime, meaning that they are not likely to be lenient. They are looking for people that are very, very devoted to the they are not going to hire somebody that is very open about the fact that they want to completely overhaul and change systemic practices within police forces. And they also think that it is likely that they are going to overcorrect in order to show that they can be trustworthy, meaning that they are going to start following the exact same problematic practices that hurt minority and marginalized communities, meaning that they're not going to be an ally, they are simply going to be another cog in a machine. This is why they don't fix disconnect. This is why they make, this is why they're not actually like helping change anything in the system. But second, in terms of like insider information, I think this is kind of like a bizarre point because we already have things like informants that ensure that people that know like the criminal systems really well and like give the police information to help them like solve big crimes and take down big drug rings without like handing them a gun and telling them out to go and protect people. Second though, let's tell you why existing background checks aren't going to work, why they don't even access like safe people to put in the force. Why is this so much worse on the proposition? Because we think the communities that have been hurt by police a lot and the systemic like racism within police forces and the justice system don't want to become police to the degree that they claim because they don't want to be enforcing harmful policy on their own communities, on people that look like them, that have the same lived experiences as them. I don't see the incentive as a person whose livelihood has been destroyed by police brutality now wants to like go out on the streets and then be brutal, right? That means that you have two groups of people that are likely to try to join. One, like literal white supremacists, or two people that just want to like take advantage of this and to the, of the unique power structures that police are given, right? Weapons and institutional protections to do harm. And Pop literally concedes this, right? They tell you in that last speech that current officers are overwhelmingly white and privileged. Why is this going to change on their side of the house? It just means that if you're hiring ex-cons, it's white and privileged ex-cons. At their highest ground, it's a white and privileged ex-con that has no criminal affiliation and is a nonviolent offender, but that means that they're still not accessing any impacts of bridging communities because those ex-cons don't come from the communities that they want to like create connections with. The second response here is that a lot of departments lack proper resources to conduct quality background checks on people. Not all of them are the NYPD, the LAPD, like they don't have extensive resources to ensure that the people that they're hiring is safe. They also need people, right? More democracies are backsliding, they're expanding their police forces, they're willing to hire whoever's going to take the job. And thirdly, we tell you about criminal obligations being a lot higher, meaning that people are at risk of public, there's a bad prison condition. Note that they never engage in this. Why is this so bad? Is police have unique societal protections that no other job grants you. It in 
increases the likelihood that they are going to do a lot of harm against the community drastically. Even if it is one person, right? They try to tell you that this harm is marginal. We think that is incredibly bad. On our side of the house, if we can protect just one person, one community from being harmed, we think that that is like inherently a reason to vote for us. Before I go on to the second point, I'll take a point. The current average police officer is white and quite conservative, whereas the current average ex-convict is likely to be a person from a marginal, uh, marginalized group who comes from a disenfranchised ba background. Given letting ex-convicts letting ex-convicts apply does not mean that they are going to be hired. So congratulations, a bunch of people that are ex-cons from marginalized communities suddenly fill out an online application to the NYPD, but they are turned away because as you just mentioned, there are structures within the hiring process that inherently favor people that are white and wealthy. You needed to tell us why that was going to change, why someone was going to see the word ex-con and get rid of all of the racism in the hiring system. Second then on how communities view. Let's get two levels of this. First is the communities that they work in. They say that, oh, communities are going to trust them more. Look, ex-cons are not like beloved within communities because they're ex-cons, right? Like even marginalized communities are not necessarily like really happy to see somebody, especially if they are like, enforcing laws, especially if they've committed violent crimes in the past. And also it's unlikely they're going to be super known because they just spent a lot of time in prison. So why do they trust less? Because people don't trust ex-cons. The media is likely to blow this up. They like to sensationalize things, meaning that now people don't trust the police either. But let's look at the general public then. There's a media sensation people that dislike convicts, that don't hate convicts, but don't necessarily want them protecting them with guns, are now no longer going to trust the police. And in exchange, they're going to push for more draconian policy. This is when you get really long mandatory minimums to keep people in prison, because they're going to do whatever they can to ensure that their police forces do not have dangerous individuals or people that they perceive as dangerous individuals due to media sensationalization that they haven't disproved. Final substance then on inner force, disrupting inner force dynamics. The thesis here that's going to make police a lot less cooperative. We already told you how police culture is very anti-crime, anti-conflict, and why this is inherent and incredibly embedded. No chance that this has changed. Why is this bad for the proposition? Because the police that exists now are not going to welcome them with open arms. We're going to see massive amounts of animosity and distrust between police and ex-cons that are hiring as police, leading to fracturing in police departments. This is really bad because the police become a lot less productive and a lot less cooperative. They're a lot less likely to share information and work as teams, making them not only productive, I mean, un productive, the plot doesn't access any acceptance by police as they have no interest in collaborating. This is the worst world to have less capable police and more alienated ex-convicts proud to oppose. I thank the second speaker of the opposition and invite the third proposition speaker. Here, here. Thank you. Once again, PYs in the chat, please. <clears throat> Hanoel, the exact problem with the status quo is the opposition case. The idea that criminals do not deserve a second chance, the idea that they are monsters, the idea that they can never redeem themselves and that society will never like them. On our side of the house, we fix the disconnect that currently exists within the police force and uh, and and impoverished uh, communities. So that proposition is never properly engaged with the real, uh, with the actual, with the status quo. Because in the status quo, it is not the case that police officer, like for the vast majority of police uh, officers, it is not the case that they are actively just blat blatantly racist. It is the idea that they have biases that someone from the inside needs to take out. It is the idea that someone that has been through the system as well can show them how to actually engage engage with people. It is at the moment that that is your colleague, at the moment that you respect them, the moment that that, was, that that is someone you spend hours with, that someone that becomes your friend, that is the moment that you actually are likely to change. We need change from the inside because the outside is not effective enough. In the speech, what will I be doing? Firstly, I will be talking about their second argument, namely on how the perception of the justice system changes and now onto the more relevant things in this debate, namely on the quality of police officers. Firstly, on the perception of the justice system. So this proposition brought this argument on how this is likely to create a lot of anger and media sense, uh, and media uh, is likely to sensationalize this and that will lead to public backlash. Three responses. 
firstly, know that media, know that the media uh, sensitization uh, is only a best short term issue. It is not like at the moment that this policy is imposed, it is not likely to in the long term be relevant. At the moment, at a certain moment, it's not interesting to read about it anymore. At a certain moment, it is simply the new normal. So at best, this is a short term issue. In the long term, we still have our benefits. But secondly, know that there's also a lot of media that is likely to be positive about this. So this is, for example, more left wing media that supports reforms and actually restructuring the way that the police works. Therefore, at best, it is likely to counterbalance each other and people that already think that they people should deserve a chance uh, are likely to still believe that and people that think that they do not deserve a chance are still likely to believe that. But thirdly, note that this clash is actually dependent on the other clash. Namely, if the police still functions on our side of the house and doesn't become a terrible, terrible thing, I think this will actually reflect good on criminals because it shows that, they, that at the moment that the police force even can trust them, that you as an individual can also trust them, that they do deserve a second chance it is not likely to completely change like even if there's one bad example i don't think that this completely shapes people's perspectives because they know that there's also plenty of other examples in which this does work thus that means that people are otherwise also more likely to give criminals a second chance or at best it is a short-term harm i don't think this should be debate winning now let's get on to real debate impact namely interactions between people ways to actually impact people's lives what said opposition told you is that this is likely to lead to worse police officers for this they've given us three mechanisms firstly on corruption three responses firstly we talk to you about why we have a selection process that means that we also are likely to look into their background how much contact they have still with people that are also still for example criminals etc likely to look at what their motives are i think this is unlikely secondly it is highly uncomparative if anything i think if you're a cartel and you want someone to infiltrate the police force i think you're more likely to not do that with an ex-convict uh, but someone that for example might also be criminal but is not convicted yet therefore i'm very unsure what the comparative is here but third I think it's just unreasonable and actually disrespectful to say that convicts cannot change, that they are always stuck in their past lives. I think that is simply disrespectful that they can change. we very proud to propose about that. But secondly, I tell you, they're likely to create cut corners because they have less respect for the law. Two responses. Firstly, I think this is actually far less likely because they felt the effect of not obliging with the law and therefore they're less likely to do it and more likely to respect it. Secondly, other officers are actually far more likely because they don't actually know no thank you, because they don't actually Actually know what the actual effects are of cutting corners. So, for example, we told you about why they very often have an incentive to, at the end of their shift, for example, hand out far more fines just they want to be reach a certain uh, number of fines just because that reflects good on them, not really knowing how that actually impacts people's situation at home. Thirdly, I tell you that these officers are desensitized. To, uh, desensitized to violence and are therefore more likely to do it. Firstly, I think you could say the same about other police officers. So I think that's uncomparative. They also see violence on a daily basis. But secondly, Sam already told you this, no response to the second off. And actually, you know the effect because you've been on the other side of the violence. Therefore, you know, knowing that officers have done that to you, what that does to people, how terrible it is, and that you should not do that to other people. I think that is a scenario in which we're more likely to be empathetic that is the scenario in which you're more likely to know that the other side are also humans and what that what you do as weight. No, thank you. I see your pretty wise in the chat. Okay. Then they tell you, yeah, but the people that want these jobs just want these jobs to have power. And uh, so therefore, these will be terrible people. They have to they have to prove to us two things in order to make this stand. Firstly, that these people will get the jobs at the moment that there are people that only want power. But secondly, that, um, that only those people apply. Firstly, I don't think that these people will get the job. Why? The police force is not openly racist or openly sexist. Maybe these are small biases, but it's not something you're going to advertise with when you want a job. Therefore, it is very unlikely. Moreover, people that have records for that are not likely to be hired because they will receive a lot of backlash for it. Therefore, it's uncomparative. But secondly, we think we talked to you about two incentives. Why actually also good people are likely to apply for this, namely because they want to make a change, because they want to do something good for the community. Therefore, we think there's also very good people applying that are far more likely to get the job. Before I go on as to why we told the police officers are better on our side of the house of QI. In your second speech, you tell us that the vast majority of police officers are white and privileged. On your side of the house, why wouldn't they exclusively hire white and privileged ex-convicts? Look, because I think this is a unique chance for them because of the specific push for change that you talked about to also get minorities into the police force. Because of that push for change is more likely to actually happen on our side of the house the moment that we give these people an actual chance because they are now at least allowed to apply to begin with. 
Okay, on to why we told you that we have better police officers. We talked to you about why they have crucial skills. They have the knowledge about deep privileged communities. They have seen the other side of the law and that is the knowledge that crucially makes them better than other officers. We told you that it's incredibly important because it means that they're more likely to be em empathetic. It means that they have more insider info and it means that they can change the mindset of other officers. Know that the way that people get into echo chambers is by not hearing any other perspective. At the moment that you now, for example, have these people into the police officers, that is the moment that you can break through these echo chambers. That is the moment that you can show people the other perspective. So the proposition tells you, no, you can't do that. They're too indoctrinated. Panel, I think that is very unlikely. Firstly, not everyone is that indoctrinated. I think there's actual people with also good incentives that aren't blatantly racist on a police force that now at least know better how to engage with these people, which on the comparative they wouldn't. Secondly, at least new officers can be influenced by this. I think we have to far more new and context about what the police force, what actual criminals looks like. It looks like. Then they tell us, yeah, but there's already a big push to make the police better. And then they tell you, yeah, but we need to do it internally because the push isn't enough. This is the internal change that we need because the push isn't enough indeed. We need internal change to show officers what they need to do. We do that. They also tell us, yeah, but these officers will also fall into the same traps because they uh, because they look are looking for crime in there, so they will also have these biases. No, they know what it feels like. They've been in prison for years. They've been through the system. I think that is the moment that just working somewhere doesn't change your experiences. The knowledge that you have, the way you grew up. That is something that is exclusive to our certain house and that will always outweigh any impact inside opposition because we actually have more connection with impoverished communities that are not scared of the police anymore on our certain house. They are more likely to keep you out of crime, people that you can talk to on our certain house, very proud of you both. I think the third speaker of the proposition and invite the third opposition speaker to deliver the last constructive speech in this debate. Here. here. All right, um, verbal POIs, please. It was demeaning of proposition to assume just because ex convicts joined the police force, minorities would be would feel protected. Minorities are not anti and are, are not pro criminal. Crime does serious damage to their communities, true, but they are also not protected by police officers. And that is because of historic injustices, proposition does not remedy, which means in the status quo, they are largely just without an advocate. On our side of the house, we supported increasing diversity in the force. But the difference was that on their side of the house, minor, or moderates that were not inherently pro-police or and was not inherently anti-convict were just afraid of their own communities being policed poorly and being put in danger. These are the people that are likely to get scared and enforce things like crackdowns. These are the people that are likely to reinforce stigmas that already exist, but make them way more harmful in their first place. I never, I don't think they engage. With that, three clashes in the debate, but first, I'm just going to engage with the argument in their last speech, that essentially they get a second chance and that's incredibly important. There are a ton of options, even in the status quo, for a good, economically fruitful life after prison. Even further, on our side of the house, considering truly how radical this policy is, from the one, we told you we, we improved things like access to other opportunities, job options, options that didn't hand you a gun on the first place. Even further, we think for the people that leave, that leave prison, either feel guilty for their actions or just want to improve communities, there are a lot of ways they can do this, right? I think these are the people that are most effective by becoming a political advocate, a community or social worker, right? These people that give directly to communities, particularly the people that believe the police structurally is hurting them and not just a problem from the inside. Well, Here's the problem with their case. I think their way of changing police violence was internal. They said, you work within a really corrupt system and then maybe there's a risk that you as an individual are able to change it. We say this was unlikely, but just not really a risk, risk we are willing to take. We say you reform the system by pushing against it directly. That is only what you get on our side of the house. We say all the mobilization they happened within their force at their very best. We say it's better if all those people just reform the system from the outside. We say that is far more likely to change. With that, rest of this debate. First question I want to ask is who actually gets in the system in the first place and what does the system self-select for? First, I think it is that people that are previously harmed by police brutality are least likely to apply. Notably, considering there are at least some alternatives in the status quo and our world gets more alternatives, this is not like an option of not having a job or being a police officer right in the first place, right? There are options that exist even if they're not as important. This is because there's historical harm that has been committed against particularly minority communities, right? I think when they say communities that are predisposed to crime, I think 
what they mean, really mean are communities that are predisposed to be over-policed, right? I don't think minorities are predisposed to crime. They are disposed to being targeted. In this situation, it is institutional harm that they face, right? These are cannot be like, these are problems that cannot be fixed from the inside. That is to say, if you have been a direct, um, like, um, if you've been directly harmed by police brutality, not just will you not be brutal as a police officer, you just will never be a police officer in the first place because you fear the institution and everyone within it. This is also true that you fear your treatment within the police force, right? If everyone around you is someone that is like actively hurting your community, it's very unlikely why you would ever subject yourself to that kind of workplace in the first place. There were other options. We said those the people that are most likely to be able to fix the system were least likely to apply in the first place. DOI. Also me. Even if everyone on their side of the house actually decides to like join the force and enter the hiring process, the process itself self-selected out of this, right? The whole thing is like, oh, well, they're not going to be openly racist. Fine. They didn't need to be. All they needed to do was say on a personality level or say that one, like someone that is white, that is also an ex-public had been like more reformed as a person and had changed to a greater degree. All of these things are very subjective criteria, which means on their side of the house, it's far more likely you get people that are ex-convicts that are pro-police and are also white and privileged. This is the worst combination of all factors, right? These are the people that committed a hate crime, or these are the people that maybe went to the Charlottesville riot, riot and got arrested, right? And are sent to prison. These are the people that are likely to end up back in the police force in the first place and doing all of the harms. Again, the people who are left are the people that are least, are like most disposed to violence, but also like the police the most, which is obviously predisposed to like white supremacists in the first place. Note all of this made every impact about improving community safety much, much worse because the actual acts of police brutality drastically increased on their side of the house. Before I move on to the second clash, I'll take your point. Okay, so we already explained that this is spe specifically symmetrical, the systemic problems in, for instance, personality tests or whatever, but we explained that st uh, stations are more likely to devote resources to specifically ex-convicts because there would be more political pressure on that. So at least on our side of the house, we fix this problem of not enough checking on police officers. Again, it's thoroughly like unclear how you get this like magical increase in political pressure, considering we gave you an entire argument of how you get more like um, more violence against ex-cons in the first place, you get like more public like resentment against them, right? But on the second argument, like fine, here's the status quo, a world in which a lot of people apply that are not ex-convicts and there is still a general like preference for white individuals. We say this is just, this is bad, but it's obviously less harmful than that same system existing in the terms of like people that have actually committed crimes because then the preference is far more likely, like it's, it's far more, it's like a much greater degree of preference toward people that have like likely committed crimes, but in a racialized, hateful setting, and are likely to do that again in the first place. Second argument is on public response. Note, this argument came before the argument about what actually happened within the departments, considering even if proposition implements their world perfectly, the public will still like perceive it as being very, very radical, even if they do it well. Note, it literally only takes one instance of someone that had been an ex-convict messing up within the force in order for a cable network like Fox News to talk about only that instance for like a year, right? And we know this is going to happen because in the status quo, people that weren't ex-convicts still make mistakes, still make intentional acts of violence, and that is like obviously exists in the first place. So in their world, you just harp on the instances that were caused by ex-convicts. Why did this matter? It is because moderates, they're alienated uniquely from this policy did two things. First, they were more likely to support things like crackdowns and harsh sentences just against people who commit crimes in the first place. We know this is likely because politicians are already advocating for these policies are on their side of the house. You just increase their public base of support. So those policies are more likely to pass and those really extreme politicians are more likely to get into office. Second, there is a Re, um, there's a reignited stigma against X crimes. We say the stem of the status quo is like slow, but I think it is decent, right? That it eventually there is more support for X criminals in the first place. Their side of the house reverses all the progress, and makes it very, very difficult for you to get other options outside the police force. Lastly, we said there was less trust in the police. Note, this was a, the, like the same for all communities in the first place, right? And note, this is like, these are communities that need some trust in the police. You need people to actually call the police when say you're experiencing something like domestic violence where you've been robbed, right? All of these need engagement with the police. If you fear that a criminal is going to not come to your service, you will never call and we do not get any benefits. And note, this also applies to all police officers and not those that are actively doing harm. Lastly, on policing itself. 
we gave you a lot of mechanisms here. I think really only corruption was like covered to a reasonable degree. I think our most intuitive argument here was that you put people who have shown more than the general public that they're going to commit crimes, you give them the weaponry and you give them the legal protection of things that say, oh, well, they were acting in self-defense. They're a police officer, so they're going to be in harm's way. This is the sort of scenario in which crimes go up and then more crimes are let free because all the situations in which someone like, like you know, has insider information are all reasons why you're just less likely to arrest people, less likely to get crime committed. And all of this was predisposed to people that are likely to commit crimes, violence, and particularly against minorities. This is the worst case scenario. We say avoid this scenario at all costs. Very proud to oppose. I thank the third speaker of the proposition uh, of the opposition and invite the opposition reply. Here, here. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. I want, to, I want you to imagine if tomorrow the police chief of New York City, a city that has been suffering from devastatingly high levels of crime stood up and said, we are gonna now start hiring ex-convicts to our police department. The people that were suffering from high levels of crime that were concerned about their security for so many months would not be incredibly excited about this. They were going to retaliate, they're going to push back and conditions for ex-convicts would get worse. The police department would get delegitimized. At best on their side of the house, they got a couple more ex-convict working low level jobs. That was not enough to cause the massive societal level change. What was gonna cause that change was backlash. I wanna talk about two things. The first thing I wanna talk about is about public backlash. We give you three independent reasons why backlash was gonna happen. First of all, people inherently had a stigmatized view of criminals. Second of all, it's because these types of conflicts were likely to be well known in their community. So people would feel personal grievances. And finally, the media would harp on this. This would be an amazing opportunity for growing media groups to sensationalize the fact that in places where crime is increasing that now they're hiring ex-conflicts. Their responses were simply insufficient. First, they said it was short term, that did not matter. Even even if it was short term, people cared about their uh, people cared about their security, and they were going to rally around policies that hurt ex-convicts, and they were going to immediately lose trust in the police department. Secondly, they told you that there's going to be a left-leaning problem. Panel, left-leaning, right-leaning, it does not matter. It was the moderates that were concerned for their security that even if they were concerned about the police department, were far more scared of crime that were going to retaliate. And finally, they told you that this would reflect the good. No, we told you that this is not in line in the incentives of media groups that want to sensationalize failures that want to show scandals and therefore would show the fact that it's drug dealers that are getting hiled on to the police department. We outweighed their case. Even if they got the most amazing, pristine ex-convicts, it did not matter. We outweighed. Number one is because you got a massive increase in draconian policies that forced mandatory minimums and caused ex-conflicts to be pushed into crime far longer. Second of all, you got an increase in crime. People were less likely to trust the police department and less likely to report them. This causes a toxic cycle where crime continues to increase. People continue to become concerned concerned upon crime and, and push for the tough on crime policies that hurt minorities. Public backlash was damning. It clearly won us to debate. Let's move on to their case. They banked their case on two assumptions. The first assumption was that ex-convicts were going to get reform. Let's take them at their highest ground. The ex-convicts are excellent people. There were three reasons why they wouldn't get reform. Number one, they were low ranking people so they could not structurally change systemically racist departments. Secondly, because of increasing scrutiny, they would pander to the high ups and become even more abusive for them to get legitimacy and not get fired. And third of all, even if they applied, what they conceded themselves is that it would be white privileged people hiring them. So it would not be the minorities that would be getting the job. It's the white privileged conv convicts that would be getting the job, meaning that they get no solvency on reforms. The second argument they give you is about the perception of trust. This also didn't make sense. Number one, people don't inherently like convicts. I think it was demeaning of them to say that minorities just magically like people that are criminals. They never gave us any structural reasons why this is the case. In fact, 
Minorities are disproportionately affected by crime. They would be most opposed to people like convicts getting in the military. But secondly, even if you hired a couple of more convicts, you can change the history of discrimination and violence that has occurred against minority communities. They never prove why this would outweigh the structural problems that exist. If anything, we told you that crime would be worse on their side of the house, that you get worse police officers, ones that did not want to change the system, but want to consolidate their own power and control. People that for clear reasons were more prone to commit things like crime, they were more likely to cut corners, and that when they were given a weapon, were more likely to use violence. They say that, like, essentially, like, people can change, right? Yeah, it's probably great if people can change, but if you're a prison gang and you have obligations to these criminal groups, it does not matter. You're obligated to look over crime. They also tell you that they get things like insider info, but this does not matter. Police departments can always use informants. They never told us specifically why they hired to hire, had to hire convicts. At the end of the debate, the debate is clear. Public backlash was was completely inevitable, and any of the benefits they got on reforms was marginal and likely did not happen. We clearly took this debate. Thank you. I thank the opposition reply and invited the proposition reply to conclude this debate. Here. here. Hi, I'm presuming that I'm still audible. Great. Uh, then I will start my speech. Pano, I'm going to front load the most important material. Um, I'm guessing at this point you're asking what judge, all judges are constantly asking, which is where is all the weighing? So here it is. In the opposition reply, despite the fact that both the, fir the first and second opposition speakers spend significantly more time on the quality of individual police officers, they make a big push on the idea of backlash and that being the most important idea in this debate. Two mechanisms of weighing, since opposition thinks that they're losing on the quality of police officers, as to why that's actually significantly more important than backlash. The first is on long-term versus short-term. Because note, in the first and most explicitly in the second speech, we already explained that this is a very short-term issue, that over time, individuals get used and are raised into society in which this is a normalized thing, but also that the media won't like continuously be talking about ex-convicts being able, allowed in the police for 20 years straight. So sure, maybe in a short five uh, short five month span, people are very outraged as this policy get passed, but prop opposition was never able to prove why in the long term that would have significant enough consequence, uh, significant consequences. So sure, temporarily, maybe police officers or uh, uh, convicts have a slightly harder life. But in the long term, we explain that our, uh, our benefits are continuous. You keep getting police officers, not very many, but still police officers who are ex-convicts will make significantly better decisions than other police officers. The second is on prioritization. So on the national scale, a lot of this policy doesn't matter too much because the vast majority of, poli uh, of, poli uh, of uh, uh, police abuse doesn't happen uh, in the big flashy stories that you see. It's when everyday police officers turn off their body, uh, bo uh, body cams to be a teenager on the street. We tell you that when we get police officers who are significantly less likely to do so, we, are significant, uh, we significantly decrease the rate of individuals who are unnecessary necessarily harmed. So sure, I guess at our worst, they slightly win on backlash. However, such a big idea, I don't think really compares the idea of average police, the average police officer being slightly less likely to randomly kill someone or randomly beat someone up. So in terms of like the mechanistic quibbles, firstly, in terms of the comparison between the average ex-convict police officer versus the average status quo police officer, because that's the question you have to ask when you think about the quality of individual police. And then secondly, about the trust between police and different communities. Firstly, in terms of the comparison between average ex convict police officers and versus the average police officer in the status quo. The most important thing here is on the criteria that opposition keeps pushing us on. So basically we say that the current average person who applies to the police office is white and they're conservative. <clears throat> Whereas the mass majority of average, the, uh, the vast majority of ex convicts will likely be from marginalized backgrounds, from impoverished backgrounds, that will, will likely be against systemic corruption and against systemic brutal, uh, brutality. They're likely to be the ones least likely to accept bribes and corruption because they're the ones get, who get investigated first, which is completely inherent above all questions of what kind of people get, uh, uh, get accepted. But secondly, they all have unique insights around crime from having the personal experience required there. That also stands above all other criteria questions. They say, that police will selectively choose for the most white, most conservative, and most, most supremacist individuals. But firstly, they only give reasons as to why that is a broader systemic issue which should exist on either side of the house. So that means that on the opposition side of the house, they're selecting that as well. What then changes, and it's slightly more likely that you get individuals from marginalized, impoverished, and anti-brutal, uh, uh, and also who are 
anti-brutality and anti-corruption uh, because the pool changes. Where the vast majority of ex-convicts uh, who will apply will look, uh, will look like this and have these kinds of beliefs, which I, we think they make it significantly more likely that you can't get these kinds of individuals to the offices. In addition to the inherent things that we say about corruption, they're less likely to get offered bribes in the first place. And secondly, about the insights around crime. It was never about changing the entire system. It's about changing one person at a time. Even if one police officer is significantly less likely to, com uh, to, commit, uh, to commit a crime, we think it's worth it. The second uh, clash doesn't really matter too much. It's about the trust between police and communities. And the reason I don't make time for it is because opposition plates individual communities with society at large. We explain why individuals who are in specific communities might not like crime, but what they do like is police officers who are able uh, who are able to speak to use in that area for prevention. They have a name with and who they can contact on from that area. That's something that we uniquely provide these communities which opposition cannot. That's why you should vote for proposition. I thank the proposition reply and I thank both teams for this fine debate. Uh, and now I think I can stop the recording.